Okay, thank you for joining my talk. This is um, three common pitfalls in microservice integration and how to actually avoid them. So this is what I will talk about as well. Um, first, who am I? My name is Felix Müller. Um, I'm technical consultant with Kamunda. You have seen us probably outside already. We have a small booth there. Um, and throughout the talk, you will probably get to know what we are actually doing. Um, some people here might use our software already. So we'll talk about this later. And I think that's all I'm going to talk about me for now, because we have lots to cover today um, in this talk. So we'll just go straight um, in it. Um, within this talk, I won't only talk about microservices, but also um, all different other types of um, topics here, like REST and SOAP. Um, and we're going to cover all different kinds of areas here. So don't be surprised if you hear any of these um, <coughs> names here. When we're talking about microservices, um, one of the key things is to realize is that um, it's mostly that we will talk also about distributed systems somehow. Because you're building these small um, different services, they are basically self-contained systems, but in the end they have to communicate with each other in one or the other way. Um, and I quite like this um, picture to visualize what is going on, basically. You can imagine this um, rough ocean here, and one of your microservices could be, for example, the small house you're sitting in there, and then you're trying to communicate with the other system, and you're going out um, to this rough ocean. Um, this is basically the network that you're facing. You don't know what is going on. Everything could happen there. Um, many things can go wrong, and you don't know what exactly could happen. Um, and from these different um, things in the distributed system, we basically um, will talk about these three different um, problems or pitfalls, how um, we call them here today. Um, and I will go through them step by step. Um, so let's start first with um, communication is uh, complex. That's going to be the first thing. That's what is also the basic main problem when you're in this rough ocean in the end. So let's imagine we have these different um, services that we build, our self-contained microservices. And um, let's imagine, for example, um, one hour of our services um, starts to fail, starts to break. For some reason, um, we can't reach it anymore. And the main problem is basically now when you um, are communicating from one service to the other one, um, that you have to um, try um, to prevent that this one failure that will happen in one service breaks down the whole system, basically. So you have to try to keep the um, failure and errors local in this one microservice, and not that in the end your whole system goes down only because one single microservice um, breaks or fails. So this is what um, we're going to try out first. I'm going to show you a very simple example. We're going to have lots of live coding here, um, or code um, in this demo as well. So I will show you some examples um, too. So we're going to use a um, very simple thing here at the moment, just a very simple Java Spring Boot um, service. We're going to have here a small payment service that calls um, some other service via REST API. Um, the credit card service, more or less. So these are two different microservices. Just imagine um, that we implement them. And this is where we jump right into code straight away. This is the first example. Um, I'm going to open my Eclipse now. So this is a very simple Spring Boot project um, that we set up here. And um, I have here some payment REST application. This is um, already running now. And then there are different examples now that I'm going to show you one after another. And we're going to jump into the code um, and see what's going on. In the end, it's relatively simple. We have here um, some um, request mapping. So we are expecting here um, a payment um, that you can call. You can call this put method. It's not about now showing you um, how you can make this um, requests, basically. I guess most of you have already implemented something similar. Um, what we do inside there, then, is we charge this credit card. Um, there's a message here, and charging a credit card is basically we call another microservice in there via REST. Could be also in a different way. Could be SOAP, if you prefer that. I guess REST is something that is um, most common nowadays. And in the end, we get some um, transaction ID back from this credit card service, and we return that in the end if it's fine. So um, we have basically these two different services running now, one with the payment endpoint and one that has this um, charge credit card endpoint. 
So if I go here to my iTerm, I have them running both at the same time. You will see on the left-hand side, this is the REST application that I just shown you in Eclipse. And the middle one, this is my payment service that is running now at the moment. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to use um, Postman just to create a new payment, basically, to start a new um, request at the moment. And when I send this request, you will see straight away, OK, we call internally. Um, we are basically charging this credit card here. We are going into this method. And we straight away get the response back. And this is the status um, completed that we get straight away. So um, now imagine this is still fine. This uh, is, is very good. But what happens now if our service, this um, credit card service, is, for example, slow, slow or fails? Um, what would you expect then to happen? Anyone has an idea, maybe? Yeah, this could happen, for example. So let's see. Um, we will make our service now slow. Um, this is just a very simple command line. Um, so we randomly have now a longer response time from this um, credit card service. And what I'm going to do now, again, is I'm going to start another request. And you will see it will load and load. And this will take um, forever, basically, to get this response. Um, and this is. Um, can be a problem. Maybe it's now yeah, still not a big problem, but it could be that now, if you imagine a client, it could request and request and do more requests all the time. And at some point, this will basically bring down the whole system because um, all these requests will pile up in the threads. And then at some point, we're not going to have um, enough threads anymore to handle the requests. And at some point, probably both of the services are going to break, even though only one um, was broken or slow at the beginning. So this is basically um, what we want to avoid. Has anyone heard of um, a circuit breaker pattern? Here in audience. Ah, very good. That's like half of the people. Very, very nice. Um, so this is a pattern that you can use to basically um, circumvent such um, situations. Um, one implementation of such a circuit breaker um, that is quite famous is um, Hitstrix from Netflix. They have built something like this, also open source. Um, and you can just build it and use it in your Java application in a very easy way. Um, and it handles all these kinds of things that in case an error happens, basically, um, we don't continue the requests anymore to these services, but we just stop um, and give the response straight away. I will show you how this looks like now. So um, the same implementation, basically, but on top of that, we add um, the circuit breaker. And if you see here, this is now the second example. We retrieve again the payment. We charge the credit card. And this time, it's just a small little wrapper. This is Hystrix command that we are creating. And inside, we call um, the same REST service, basically. Um, and if I do now the same request, my service is still slow. I will do the same request. And now you will see straight away that after about um, one second, this is something that you can configure inside of Hystrix, um, how fast you get this reply, basically. Um, it will give you this internal server error. And it basically, you get a response instead of waiting forever, which is quite good. Now you can also, um, in Hystrix, basically, um, save this, and then you can see at some point and bring the service back up. So this is um, pretty nice. We can do that um, now multiple times, and our service will give us a response, at least. OK. So this is what we have learned from that, is at least, is that failing fast is something that is very important. Um, so it's good now that we give this response back um, to the client straight away. But in most situations, this is not enough. So you have seen um, this is a good thing, but probably um, an internal server error is not what we want to propagate um, back. And um, in order to continue now, I want to introduce you um, to a little real-life example. So some of you might um, know this guy. This is Bernd Rücker. He is the co-founder of Kamunda, the company um, I work for. And um, he has got some problem. Um, Bernd, he has to travel a lot because he attends many conferences. He goes to many customers all over the world. Um, and this is why, basically, every day in the week, he's on the road. Um, that's 
I guess not a problem. Most of you guys probably do that. They travel a lot um, for, for coding, for consulting, and so on. But um, his problem is relatively specific. He also has to fly a lot. And unfortunately, when he's flying, many things go wrong. Um, I don't know how it is with you, if everything works always. Um, at least for me also, this is um, something that doesn't work often. Um, he has a very specific problem, so always when he tries to check in um, on the websites of these um, yeah, airline companies, he gets such errors. So this is now um, a German screenshot, but there's a translation basically um, saying that an error cured why he tried to check in for his flight. And um, this is something that regularly happens to him. He's happy to collect all the screenshots, and then we put them here on the slide. So this is great. Um, this happened on the Eurowings website. Um, so now let's try to figure out um, what happened there in detail. So there's Bernd here, um, and he tried actually to check in using some web user interface. Um, so now let's see, let's dig a little bit deeper in this check-in service um, what could go on there. And basically, it could be that we have here um, some barcode generation, um, and we have at the same time maybe some output management. And um, Bernd now has a lot of background knowledge from IT systems, and what he has seen in his career often is that things like barcode generation is something that can break relatively often. So um, there things can go wrong. It could be, for example, that barcode generation is still happening on only one host somewhere, um, and only one code can be generated at a time. Um, so there's a lot of things that um, yeah, could lead to errors. So um, something that's very nice that he has seen on this website from Eurowings, um, they actually put the circuit breaker pattern there in place. So on their website, um, instead of bringing down the whole web UI and the whole website, um, they said, hey, we have the single service that doesn't respond. We just sent an error message and we show it um, to the end user. So they broke that into pieces, and that's um, a quite nice thing. Um, much better than these guys. Um, this is from a United website. They instead um, just yeah, displayed this internal server error straight to the end user during check-in. So these are real screenshots. We are not trying to make this up. This really happens, unfortunately. Um, maybe it happened to you as well. Um, so this is still okay what Eurowings is doing, but it could be maybe better because there's one problem at the moment when this error occurs here in the barcode generation. What we are doing is we are still propagating the error and the problem back to the end user. Um, and this means that Bernd, he has to retry basically manually. He has to try to check in again and again and again because in order to fly, he needs this barcode. Um, and that's a huge problem for him um, because he has to do that all the time and he has to remember that. He has to put it maybe in the calendar so he doesn't forget about it. And remember, he flies like every second day. So, um, yeah, that's not really nice. Um, the Eurowings website basically makes it our problem or the end user's problem. Um, and some websites go even a little bit further. So EasyJet, for example, um, they even tell the user what to do. So they tell, OK, please retry. Please um, try again. And please never call us, because um, we know that there is a technical problem, and we might fix it at some point. Um, so for the end user, it's not really nice. Um, I don't want to blame EasyJet. We had a very good connection um, from Berlin yesterday. So um, it also works, but maybe the IT system has a problem. And we have this problem now as the end user. So um, maybe it should rather look um, like this. So th the website should maybe say, OK, we know we have a technical problem here, and we will fix that, and then we will come back to you. Don't worry, user. We will do it for you. This is something that they should do, so we made um, this up. Um, so the possible solution could be this retry is something that happens automatically by the IT system and not by the end user. So it happens here in our system. Um, and in order to do that, obviously, we need something that is called state. I guess most of you know that. Um, there are different ways in um, when you're coding to handle state. And one of the ways to do that is to implement um, that manually. So you could just hard code that or write some entity classes um, or even something more modern like actors and so on um, and basically do that all in your code. 
Um, the problem with this do-it-yourself approach is that it's relatively complex at some point to implement that, um, and it takes a while, it's a lot of effort, even though you might think at the beginning, ah, it's just a state, I can handle that my, um, on my own. At some point you will see that there are certain features that maybe the business side requires from you because you don't want to have such problems as um, the EasyJet website, for example. So there are things like um, scheduling, versioning, timers, and so on that we have to implement on our own. Um, and then there's this option to go, or a second option basically that you can do, and th that's also what we would recommend, um, to use a workflow engine or a state machine for exactly the same thing. Um, this, these workflow engines can basically um, handle all of that. Some people might think they're very complex and they're hard to use, but instead I want to show you today that it's um, very, very easy to make use um, of state machines. So state machines um, are nothing new and workflow engines are also nothing new. They're around for uh, many years already, um, but they are more relevant than ever from, from my perspective. Also other companies like, for example, AWS, they have something similar, um, step functions um, to handle state basically in the cloud. So it's relevant in modern architectures. Also, um, Silicon Valley, they are implementing um, their own workflow engines, not based on a specific standard, but just because they had the need to handle that in high load scenarios. So there's something that is Uber, uh, called Uber Cadence, and there's also something that is called Netflix Conductor. Um, that's open source software. They don't have um, anything, any support or services around that, but you can just use that as a developer if you like. And they're also um, the lightweight open source workflow engines, as we call them. Um, for example, um, Kamunda BPM, JBPM, and Activity. Um, this also works at scale. So also if you have very, very high throughput, and high throughput means um, more than a few million workflow instances a second that are started in such a system. Um, and for today's demo, we're going to use um, Kamuna just because that's the company I'm working for. If you want, you can also try out the other ones, um, JVPM or Activity. So let's see how our example looks like if we put in a workflow engine and how this works. So we are going to use, um, again, the same REST controller or a very similar REST controller. And what we're going to do here now is um, we will create first our workflow. So we define what should happen in our um, process, more or less. So we are using something that's called BPMN. I will talk in a second about what BPMN is. We are creating an executable process. We call, give it a name, and then we define, OK, what should happen in the specific flow that we want to have. And the first thing that we have is that we have a start event, and then we have a service task. And this service task is basically this credit card service, the Stripe service that we are want to call in order um, to charge our credit card. And um, here we can now define, OK, which um, code do you, should you execute when the service task is reached. We will call the Stripe adapter. This Stripe adapter is basically just defined here as a class. I know it's not very nice now, now everything in one class. It doesn't have to be like this, obviously. Um, I just wanted to make it simple for, for this demonstration. Um, then we say, OK, um, this should be handled asynchronously, and we also define a specific retry mechanism. So workflow engines usually allow you automatically or per default to define what should happen in error scenarios. And we just say with this um, few um, letters and numbers here, we basically say, OK, try three times um, in a period of time of one minute. Um, and if that still fails, then we will create an incident, an error that we can then handle manually or send to another system. So we define that, um, we deploy that on our workflow engine, and in our Stripe adapter, that's what the workflow engine is calling, we have to implement something that's called a Java delegate, that's an interface that comes from Kamunda. Besides that, basically everything that we had before stays the same. So we still um, use Hystrix, and we are still posting this request in the end. And um, retrieving the payment, we basically also do exactly the same thing. We charge the, uh, charge the credit card in this way that we are then starting a process, engine, uh, process instance in our workflow engine. So um, I think we should try this out now. Let's go to Postman. 
and I will create this one. And you will see we will get um, status pending straight away, and we will get a trace ID. So um, the nice thing about workflow engines is that most of them come um, per default with um, tools that help you to visualize what is going on internally. Um, we have one web application that is called Kamunda Cockpit. Um, this is used from operators mostly, so you can see what is currently um, happening in my workflow engine. We can see we have four process definitions, and if I click here, we have one running instance, and this running instance is basically exactly our um, process that we just defined, a very simple one. Automatically, from just a few lines of code, you get this um, nice visualization that helps you to understand what is happening. Um, we also have automatically variables that we can inspect now, and we can see that we are um, waiting here. So our service is slow. This is why it takes now a while until we automatically complete then um, this workflow instance. So at some point, um, this will be executed automatically by the workflow engine when it gets in response. Um, so this is um, nice. Something that we, some kind of problem that we have at the moment is when I put it now back to normal our service, so it should um, respond to very quick fashion and I um, request this, this one again, I still get as a status appending. So this is not really nice because it happens in an asynchronous fashion. Um, in the workflow engine, it creates this workflow instance and it says, okay, everything after the start event will be, hap uh, will be executed in an asynchronous way. And that's why we get this pending um, response, even though it might be not pending because it already charged the credit card because the service immediately um, gave us a response. So um, there is a little bit more code. Um, we don't have to go now in every detail into that, but I basically created a for um, example for this. And um, adding that, we basically um, are working here with a semaphore to try um, to acquire that within a smaller period of time. And then depending if it finished or not, we complete, uh, send a complete response or a pending um, response. So if we try this one now, um, we should basically get straight away our completed response um, from the service. We will also see here um, that charging the credit card went um, very quickly. And we will see uh, now our version 3 worked. Um, they're all done. And in version 4, if we go to the history of our service, we will see we have one workflow instance that completed. So this can be um, all visualized here. We have also things like heat maps that help um, business users then to um, see what is going on, which paths have been used most frequently, and so on. So um, this is nice. Now we have a state machine. So we basically um, have one workflow in our microservice um, that does a request for us, and it handles the state. It's not a central component, so compared to the past, where often the workflow engine was like this big, massive, monolithic thing, um, we have now really can have all the workflows within our single microservices, which is quite nice. Um, it's just embedded using Spring Boot in a very easy way. So it's just one um, dependency that we add, and um, then it handles all different kinds of things for us. For example, it um, handles the retries, it handles errors. Um, obviously, the service provider now needs to handle item potency, um, but this is what should be the case when you're implementing microservices. Um, so. From our point of view, many things that I've just shown um, are business problems in the, in the base. So they are basically, the business has to define what should happen in certain scenarios. Um, exactly like on the EasyJet website, um, there are certain scenarios um, how it should be. Um, and many people, uh, many of you probably know this one as well. Um, you probably have used your credit card um, often on the website on some websites to to um, pay for something, um, and then it says, "Hey, please do not reload this page um, because we are processing this request at the moment and we don't want to charge you twice." Um, I'm always very scared if I see something like this because you never know what happens in the end. Um, maybe my account is empty after after an hour or so. I don't know. Um, 
so it should rather be like this. We should have some transaction IDs that we um, pass along through the different microservices, at least to remember um, who requested all of that. And when we um, maybe the when the end user in the, on the website reloads the page, it shouldn't charge the credit card again. So these are um, business problems that we need to handle. And um, this is something that is usually more complex, but we can handle that with the help of workflow engines very well. So we can define, for example, um, something like this. Um, when we are charging the credit cards and there are no retries left, so we don't have retries to um, call the service anymore because it may be slow or gives us an error, then um, we handle it this way that we say, hey, the payment failed, um, and maybe in some cases we refund it um, if there was a problem. Yeah. And yeah, this is a rough ocean, so you have seen there, there are many problems um, when, when we are in this rough ocean. Um, but this was only the first thing, so we have seen now how we can handle um, state with the help of workflow engines, but we haven't really talked much about um, asynchronous communication. Um, this is actually a quite um, common way to, uh, to circumvent such problems, so you just pass in this transaction ID and the rest you don't care, the user just sees a nice system, a nice um, message and the rest is handled um, on, on the server somehow magically. Um, the problem is when you're using um, communication in this rough ocean, you might have problems communicating to your other services um, and the problem that you face quite often is that you're sending messages, for example, and um, you don't know what happens with this message. Does it arrive? Um, did it arrive, but my service just didn't get back to me? Um, or did the service even <laughs> process the message, but it didn't reply for some reason because there was a network issue um, on the way back? So there are all different kinds of problems um, in, this, in this network. Um, and our workflow engine should handle all of these different things um, and can do it for us because it handles um, the state. And these workflows, um, they live in the service boundaries, as I mentioned, so you don't have to place um, one massive BPMN um, workflow for your whole service or your whole um, application, but you can really focus on where it's necessary to handle the state. Um, something that is also um, very nice is that um, this workflow engines, um, at least um, Kamunda, can be basically used in many different ways. So if you're interested, there's a nice um, blog post from, from Bernd Rücker. He explained what different architectures we have to run these workflow engines. I'm going to just show you some examples. We just used um, the Spring Boot application in my, in my code here. Um, we have seen this cockpit web application, we have seen Kamunda. Um, the state is stored usually in a relational database here, and we have seen the process. Um, so th there's a strict um, difference between what is infrastructure and what is the domain and what's, what is the process in the end. Um, we can also do that in a different way if we prefer. So we can also just place, um, for example, a Whitefly application server on it, um, place the Kamunda engine inside of this application server as a module, for example, and then just reuse it in different um, WAR files. So it really depends on how you want to use it. If you don't use Java for some reason, might some people um, don't do that, you can also um, work, for example, with Node.js um, or with C Sharp, however you um, prefer that. Just have a client um, and just communicate via REST API with the process engine. So this is possible as well. So we have just seen this in my example, which was quite nice, um, that in some cases um, we came back with um, the completed message and in some, pa uh, some cases we came back with a uh, um, pending message, basically. Uh, this was this, um, in the JSON in the end. And what you can also do, which is what is quite nice, and many people oversee actually when they're implementing such communication um, via REST, is that you can also act just on the response codes, right? So there are two different codes already um, defined that you can use for that. So just use a 200 if it's OK, or the 202 if it's um, just accepted um, by, by the um, servers, and then it will come back to you at some point. Okay. 
Um, some people then say, okay, but the customer wants a synchronous response. And we usually say, no, this is um, not really true. The customer doesn't want um, this to be synchronous. He is fine if this happens in an asynchronous way. So um, this is actually quite nice. Um, yeah, aside from uh, Todd who says um, that synchronous communication is the crystal mess of distributed programming. And this is why we will see and try to do this now um, more asynchronous and see what kind of problems we my, might face there. So from our check-in, um, we now gonna request this um, barcode. And one of the problems that could happen here again is um, that there might occur timeouts. So usually when you communicate in asynchronous fashion, timeouts occur um, all over the place. Maybe the system is slow, maybe the network is slow, you don't really know. With the help of workflows, this makes it much easier because you can really define what should happen when um, our service times out and we don't get a response. So for example, here in our example, we send the generate barcode command, um, we wait for the barcode, and if it doesn't arrive within every, uh, after an hour, we send a request again. Maybe our request didn't go through, and this is why we have to try it again. Um, and this is then relatively easy with a workflow engine. There are even more complex scenarios possible that you, for example, say, okay, um, this is fine, we try it all the time, but four hours before our trip, um, we then have to um, make the calls, um, call center call our um, flight passenger and tell him that he has to come to the check-in um, manually and, or manually, but in person and see that. So all of that is possible because of BPMN. Um, business process model and notation, this is what it stands for, is an ISO standard, so internationally recognized. Um, there also, there's quite much literature about BPMN if you don't know it. We also have some um, example here. Um, this is quite a um, nice book, so you can um, get it at our booth outside of one as well if you want. Why is BPMN si such a nice notation besides the things that I've just shown you? This is just the beginning, basically, of the notation. Um, the good thing about it is that it's very widespread. Um, it's possible to communicate um, to many people with this language. So it's not only a developer thing that you can write in code, but you can also do use modeling tools to use BPMN and define your workflows. And at the same time, um, it's executable and it's very mature. So it basically closes this gap between the business and development side. And from our point of view, they should work um, closely um, together, business um, and developer. And nowadays, maybe even um, as far as operations, as you have seen in the cockpit, operations can then see when incident occurs and maybe retry the service manually. They see when something goes down. So this gives you um, the possibility of proper operations um, in the system. You have things like this heat map and visibi visibility. This is something you usually <coughs> don't have when you're using microservices um, just like this. So it helps you a lot to see that. And as I mentioned, we are not the only ones who are doing such things. So there's also this thing called step functions from AWS. The disadvantage of using step functions um, compared to some like a workflow engine like Kamunda BPM is um, that they are not using this BPMN standard, also Netflix conductor um, and Cadence um, from Uber. They are also not using um, BPMN as a notation. Then you end up with um, graphs like this. This is still okay, I would say. Um, but the more complex your workflows become, the harder it gets to read. So this one looks already um, quite difficult to understand um, on the right side. Um, and just imagine how this could look like if your workflow looks like this. Um, this is going to be massive um, in the step functions notation. Also, every new person in your company has to read about that and try to find out what all of these symbols mean. Whereas in BPMN, this is something that uh, many people already know. So um, remember, your client um, has to implement this timeout and retries. Um, and why not use a workflow engine for that if it's um, relatively easy? So who of you uses a message bus? OK, that's like one third of the room, maybe, maybe a bit less. Um, so who has no problems in operating this message bus? Okay, that 
two people, okay. <laughs> At least two, yeah. That's uh, usually there's one up to two maximum um, when uh, when we do this talk. So there are all different kinds of um, problems that you can have with message bus and when you're using them. Um, things like dead messages, for example. Um, yeah, maybe some of these problems you already had in production, and then it's actually quite hard um, to work around them once it is in place. Um, that's very very tricky. Um, so some of our customers, um, they also decide to do it in a different way. So they say, okay, um, this is nice that you have this um, decoupled um, microservices and you're using just one, mi uh, one workflow engine within a service. Um, this is exactly what the microservice paradigm tells you. Um, you shouldn't um, share too much information between um, the microservices. You shouldn't have a God service and so on and so forth. We know this, but still at the same time, many customers go this, this way and say, um, yeah, um, we can have something like AMQP here as a message um, bus, but instead of that, we can also just use a workflow engine um, and replace the message bus with a workflow engine. Um, we can still be very decoupled, so all, all of our microservices just subscribe to um, our process that is here. But yes, we, we do have this um, basically intelligent system, more or less. It is a kind of a bit intelligent because it has the process flow inside. But it's kind of a trade-off. So you say, okay, um, we, we have this um, central system that we have to take care of, um, but we have many advantages that come with it. We don't face these problems um, that we do with message buses, um, but instead we can see what is going on. We are sure that our messages are being re-delivered. Um, in case of incidents, um, we're going to see that we have them and we can um, work around them, and still we can implement our services in a way that it's um, rather a microservice um, fashion. So this is one nice architecture option that I can also um, recommend you to do. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about distributed systems in this um, rough ocean. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail now, um, also because we, are, we don't have too much time today. Um, <coughs> distributed transactions, if you want to learn more about that, that's one paper I highly recommend um, you to read. This is um, quite famous in this area. So um, just give it a shot. There are all different kinds of problems when it comes to distributed transactions um, and things like um, two-phase commit, for example. The problem is just in the end that um, things like two-phase commit, they don't really scale, um, especially when you're using microservices. Um, and one quite common pattern that um, people in the microservice universe use to work around issues in distributed systems is that they use something that's called a saga pattern. How many of you have heard of saga pattern? Yeah, that's like 10, 15 percent um, of the people. Um, so the saga pattern basically describes that um, we should be able um, to roll back certain um, yeah, b certain things that have been executed in the, part, um, in the past of part of our workflow, which means in the end, um, when I have this workflow, for example, here, and in some, um, I, I have, for example, a problem here in charge credit card and an error occurs here, I'm rolling back the payment um, and say, okay, the payment failed, and then automatically this um, existing customer credit will be rolled back. So I roll back this transaction, even though this transaction is in a different system, so I don't write to the same database. I also don't use a two-phase commit to write to two different databases, but it's really just a completely different IT system that I trigger again to say, hey, um, restore this um, customer credit now. And this is something that you can do very easily with BPMN. It Saga pattern is not um, something um, that is directly related, let's say, to, to BPMN, but it's more a general concept. And in BPMN, this is one way to do it, to use um, something that we call compensation, because the workflow engine handles um, the state for us. And this is what I also um, gonna show you quickly, how we can do such things. So let's go back to our postman, and this time we're going to use the six example. We don't have time for five. So just request this one. Um, I'm going to actually do a few more, just to make it more interesting. Okay. 
Let's hope this is enough. We maybe need a few more. Um, so now we see um, we have like five <coughs> instances of uh, a little bit more complex process, the one that I've just shown you, um, now running in our cockpit. And um, what is going on now currently um, that this service is not being executed. So as you can see, um, there is something that is called an external task. So we need basically a worker that subscribes now to this work in order <laughs> to execute this. We don't have an external worker at the moment. So I still have to start one. This is why um, we have here this small Node.js thingy. Um, so in Node.js, um, we just implement a small little worker. And as you can see, when I start this, it directly executes um, these process instances. Um, so it basically does a request to the engine and asks, hey, what kind of work do you have for me currently? Um, and now you can see after a while, I just try to make it a little bit bigger. After a while, um, some of our workflow instances just went straight through. Um, but some of them also had an error. Actually, I think only one had an error. So for one, the payment failed for some reason. And um, now we, what we do for this specific instance, we can also filter that now, see hey, which instance was that. Um, we basically also restore the customer credit now. So the workflow engine automatically executes this compensating task for you. So you don't have to handle that manually. You just define it at um, design time. Okay, so this is um, a very nice pattern that you can use for this. Okay. okay, so the client that you have should implement all of these things, no matter if you do it now with a workflow engine or not. Um, things like timeouts, retry, and compensation, they are key in order to um, be successful in this distributed transaction in the rough ocean. Um, yes, your service provider also has to implement this. So the Saga pattern expects from you basically um, item potency, which means um, you can also um, roll back your um, things that you have executed, your transaction that you have executed before, even though it's not happening in a two-phase commit. So. In the end, um, it's important. You have to be aware of all this um, complexity within your distributed systems. You have to know strategies. Um, as I mentioned, one strategy is using um, the Hystrix um, circuit breaker pattern. There are also other technologies for that. It doesn't have to be um, Hystrix, of course. And it's also important um, to use a workflow engine from our point of view um, to implement things like the state for retry. Um, workflow engines also support things like versioning. This is something that is quite often a problem um, that we see. Uh, in, in real life when a workflow is live for a very, very long time. When you have long running um, processes, then it makes sense to use such workflow engine as well as for um, short running things. So if you think this is kind of interesting and you want to know more, um, we do have a few minutes, I think, left for questions. Um, I want to use this um, opportunity also um, to thank you, first of all, for listening. But at the same time, I also um, want to make a little bit advertisement. We have some event this week happening in Copenhagen. If you have um, maybe time on Wednesday, um, we are around. We have a Kamunda day, so this is like half a day event um, with also drinks and foods and so on. It's uh, free to attend. Just um, come to the booth and you can register for um, this event here and see more of what you can do in with Kamunda. Here's something from our um, customers that we have. So feel free also to contact um, us. And the, all the examples are also on GitHub and we're going to share the slides. Thank you. <coughs> Any questions? Yes? So essentially the workflow engine is just another microservice in your system, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you do it to prevent the workflow engine from getting set on fire? Mm -hmm. Because you know it's, it's the same problem with the AMQ. Yeah. The AMQ goes down, your entire system goes down. Yeah. So how is it do you have that problem or mm. 
Yeah, it, it depends in the end on your architecture, as I tried to mention as well during, during the talk. So um, it depends on, is it fine for you to share um, your state also with other services? So um, the Kamunda engine, for example, can be set up in a way that you have um, one microservices that communicates with a database that is maybe outside of this single microservice. And then we have the second um, um, workflow engine that connects to the same database. And in case of errors, you can just um, start this up. Um, but this is exactly the problem that we face. Um, this is true. What happens if you really um, only have one single um, point of failure, which is in the end the state, the database, that you have to figure out, is it okay for you to share this with other microservices? And from my point of view, it's fine. We have to make sure that the database is there. Yes, that's one problem that we could have. But other than that, um, you can have multiple workflow engines all connected to the same database, for example. Other questions? No? Okay, that's good. Thank you. <coughs>